Good afternoon. Can everybody, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Great. So, um, my name is Greta and I'm one of the dietitians here at the um, UCSF Cancer Center. And I'm going to be talking to you today about staying well by eating well. And uh, first I just want to tell you a little bit about why I work with um, oncology patients. And it's kind of, it's just a simple story. It's basically, I've been working um, here at the Cancer Center for 10 years. And um, before that I was working in oncology, but at a different hospital for about three years. And when I first started working with oncology patients, I noticed something really different about this population than most of the other patients that I had come in contact with, um, with different types of diagnoses. The one thing that I noticed is that these, this is one motivated group of patients. So it's really, it was really easy to be a nutritionist working with people that had been diagnosed with cancer because literally it was not, a, I didn't have to convince anybody to do anything. Uh, for the most part, people are coming to me saying, you know, what can I do to be healthier? What can I do to feel better? And that was really, uh, kind of got me hooked, and I said, I want to work with this population. And um, so I've, I've been working in oncology ever since then. And I was really surprised by um, some of the studies that I've seen that have looked at uh, cancer survivors' habits. So there was a big study done um, at, with the American Cancer Society about 10 years ago where they talked to 9,000 cancer survivors about whether they were following nutrition and physical activity guidelines. They actually found that 70% of patients were not following their basic nutrition and physical activity guidelines for cancer survivors. Um, less than 20% were eating that five servings of vegetables and fruits per day that were recommended. Um, and then there's been another really recent study that's gonna be presented at um, ASCO this year looking at colon cancer survivors and they reported only 9% of those patients reported following those nutrition and physical activity guidelines for cancer survivors. So this really took me aback because my patients don't come to me and I have to convince them to follow a diet. They're motivated. It's basically, what diet do I follow? There is so much information out there um, and I'm willing to do what I need to do to try to be healthier, to try to reduce my risk for cancer coming back. Um, I just don't know what to do. And so I'm hoping to kind of pass that information along to you today and give you some practical tips. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to mention is that probably being in Bay Area, we're a little bit different. So a lot of us might be healthier or more inclined to look at you know, exercising regularly and eating a healthy diet. It's kind of a normal thing that we do than maybe other parts of the United States where they were surveying people. So maybe that's where we're a little bit different than some of those statistics. And, uh, and so, you know, I kind of thought, well, if I, can, if I can leave, you know, every day at the end of the day thinking that I've helped somebody feel a little bit more control over their situation or feel a little bit better at the end of the day, then this is worth it to me. So first off, I want to just talk about people are living longer um, with as cancer survivors, as you probably heard this morning. And so as the numbers of, of patients start to grow and living, living longer, we have more research focusing on nutrition and physical activity post-treatment and what's important um, for those patients. And we've found so far uh, lower risk of recurrence um, in some studies, lower risk of death from all causes, um, and a lower risk of other chronic diseases um, and a better quality of life. So the American Cancer Society says, you know, we can now say that diet, weight, um, and exercise control improves odds after a cancer diagnosis. So kind of thinking about using um, nutrition and physical activity as your pharmacy, pharmacy with an F, not with a PH. And so just to talk about a couple of the studies that have been done, um, one looking at colon cancer survivors, uh, what they did was they followed them five years after treatment and they found that the patients that reported eating what we call a Western diet, so a Western diet is high in red meat, fatty dairy products, refined grains, and sugary desserts and beverages, those people had about over a 300% higher risk of colon cancer recurrence compared to the people that were eating the least Western diet. 
Um, they also found in that same group, they followed them now for seven years, and they found that the patients that are following the, um, generally following the American Cancer Society guidelines for cancer survivors have um, about a 42% lower risk of death from all causes and a 30% risk, uh, lower risk of cancer recurrence than patients not following those guidelines. We've seen similar study with prostate cancer. So um, men with prostate cancer following those guidelines have about a 70% lower risk of lethal prostate cancer. Um, and in breast cancer patients, we've seen that doing simple things like the combination of getting five servings of vegetables and fruits and walking for 30 minutes, six days a week, doing those two things um, lowers the overall cause of death by 50%. So some pretty significant findings so far. And there's, that's just kind of like a small handful of the studies that have been done. But just to look at food, nutrition, obesity, and physical activity, and how it's linked to the cellular processes um, that affect cancer, uh, they're really connected to all of the processes that can promote cancer. And we know that the food we eat actually talks to our genes, so at that, at that cellular level, what we're eating is sending messages to how our genes are expressed. Uh, 45 to 65% of cancer is impacted by how nutrition affects our gene expression. So it can affect things like inflammation and immunity. Those are processes that are linked to cancer. Um, it can be linked to something like apoptosis, which is cancer cell suicide. That sounds pretty good, right? We want cancer cells to commit suicide. So the food we eat can actually um, give them messages to, to do that. And so I'm um, kind of looking at what we can do with, uh, to talk to our genes and um, through our diet and also our body weight and physical activity. So those are kind of like the trio that are what we call our lifestyle and uh, guidelines. So um, the American Cancer Society has some guidelines and then we have the American Institute for Cancer Research guidelines. They're very similar and they match up, um, but I'm gonna focus in on the AICR guidelines because they're more detailed. And so uh, this is the image that they use, American Institute for Cancer Research. Their whole mission is to study uh, food, nutrition, uh, lifestyle, body weight, exercise, and how that impacts cancer risk and also risk of recurrence or progression. And um, so they have come up with a variety of guidelines. They have some for cancer risk reduction, and then they have some for cancer survivors. And basically, the guidelines for lowering cancer risk are the same as for um, recommended for cancer survivors. So just quickly, um, number one is to be as lean as possible without becoming underweight. Uh, two is be physically active for at least 30 minutes every day. Three, avoid sugary drinks and limit consumption of energy-dense foods, particularly processed foods, high in added sugar, low in fiber, or high in fat. Eat more of a variety of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and, and legumes. Limit consumption of red meats and avoid processed meats. If consumed at all, limit alcohol drinks to two for men and one for women a day. Limit consumption of salty foods and foods processed with salt. And don't re rely on supplements to protect against cancer. So I'm going to skip to guideline number four, and then we'll come back to the first three later. But um, first, the guideline number four talks about eating more fruits, vegetables, beans, legumes, and then limiting um, red meat and processed meat. Um, so basically choosing mostly plant foods. And one way to think about it is, is your, are your meals and is your diet two-thirds or more plant-based? And basically, that's the cornerstone of every every healthy diet recommendation. So if you were hearing about cognitive function today or sleep or fatigue, really the cornerstone would be eating more plant-based foods, eating more vegetables. Basically, it helps us achieve two goals. We get higher amounts of um, vitamins, minerals, fiber, something called phytonutrients, and then prebiotics. And at the same time, we're eating more plant foods, we're getting less things that have been linked with cancer um, such as excess calories, excess animal fat, too much animal protein, processed foods, added sugars. So by filling our plate with plant foods, we're going to kind of start crowding out some of the things that are more cancer promoters. So I mentioned phytonutrients, and um, 
These are basically natural plant compounds that promote health. And they do this by having those, um, those activities that talk to our genes. So they have the anti-inflammatory actions that you hear about. When you hear about eating things like turmeric and it's being anti-inflammatory, that's because of its, one of its uh, yellow orange compounds. Um, they have antioxidant activity. So that prevents some of that oxidative stress that we were hearing about affects cognitive function. Um, they also have detoxifying activity and immune boosting actions. So they basically give plants color. And so when we think about including the red, yellow, orange, white, <coughs> green, blue, purple in our diet, you can kind of think about that as your nutrition rainbow. And one of the things to think about is not can you just get this five servings of vegetables and a little bit of fruit um, as well, but can we get four or more colors in our diet every day? And so um, when you can get four or more colors in your diet, you're really maximizing your intake of some of these different phytonutrients that have unique but also overlapping interactions and actions. And so, um, one of the handouts I gave you, I've, had, I've passed out some handouts on the break. One is this nutrition rainbow, and it talks about all the different colors of plant foods and some of their actions, and what foods sort of fall into that category. Um, and then the second page is what we call your phytonutrient spectrum checklist. So, this is a checklist that you can use um, to go through your day, and it's, there's, a, there's a little circle, um, two actually, two circles for every day of the week. And this is one way that you can check in to look at how many colors have I, have I gotten today? How many did I already get today? So maybe you got at lunch, maybe you got some green with the dark leafy greens, some red with the tomatoes, um, maybe you got some I think I saw some purple onions and the sauteed vegetables, so maybe you got some purple there. Um, so sort of looking at your plan and thinking about how can I get that fourth color in or how can I get one more color in my diet and using this as a checklist. Um, in addition to vegetables and fruits, I did mention herbs and spices as being really concentrated sources of these phytonutrients. Um, teas are also very concentrated, so green tea, white tea, um, dark chocolate. So when people talk about dark chocolate being healthy for you, one of the reasons is if you have really high cocoa content or even pure cacao, which is just the pure cocoa, um, it has a lot of these phytonutrients in it. And a lot of people say, well, hey, maybe I could just take this in a supplement, right? It's hard to eat four, four plus colors a day. That takes a lot of planning and preparation. Um, the thing about it is studies have shown that taking individual supplements of phytonutrients don't have the same effect as getting them through our diet. Um, they've done studies with the, one of the phytonutrients called lycopene, which is that red color that makes tomatoes red. And... Um, They've given lycopene supplements to men because we know it has a protective effect against prostate cancer. The supplements actually had no effect on their prostate cancer risk or progression, um, but studies have shown that men that eat more tomatoes actually have a lower risk of prostate cancer progression. So if we can get it through food, we're getting a synergy because there's only a fraction of the phytonutrients that we've actually discovered to this point. Um, there's probably thousands more that we still don't even know exist, but there's, there's actions where we see these combinations of synergy, and that's probably even happening within a particular food. So tomatoes have lycopene, but there's other phytonutrients that are actually making that lycopene more activated. Um, and when we eat tomatoes, especially when we cook them, and if we have them with a little bit of olive oil at the same time, or fat, like avocados, we actually absorb that lycopene better. So there's these synergistic com combinations that happen when we're eating food that can't really happen when you're taking a phytonutrient pill. And that's why we think we see these combinations. So there is no substitute for eating your fruits and vegetables. We'll just have to think of an easy way for you to get them in you, okay? Um, and so some of these are really cool combinations. For example, with turmeric, uh, black pepper actually makes it much more 
um, absorbable. So we can absorb about a thousand times more of the curcumin, which is the phytonutrient in turmeric, if we have it at the same time that we're having black pepper. Um, it's even gonna be a little better absorbed with a little bit of fat, uh, say a little bit of oil at the same time, because that helps with the absorption. Um, when you have broccoli and tomatoes together, it's not a one plus one equals two, it's a one plus one equals 10, because the different compounds that are in broccoli and tomato actually amplify each other's effects. So these synergistic uh, compounds are really important in terms of our phytonutrients. So another common question that I get is, what about organics? And so in general, if we can think about choosing more organic foods, we're typically getting less processed foods, less chemical residues, um, less overall pesticides. Uh, one of the really interesting things that they found in studies is that actually organic fruits and vegetables tend to have higher amounts of phytonutrients because plants under stress, so they're getting attacked by insects, they're exposed to the environment, if they don't have pesticide as a little protective covering, they're under stress and then they form these phytonutrients to combat that stress. So it's protecting those plants, and then that's what gives us the health benefits in terms of all those colorful compounds. So we don't necessarily see in studies that fruits and vegetables that are organic have more vitamins or minerals, but we do see higher levels of these phytonutrients. Um, so I realize that you know we're not always gonna be able to get organic. By all means, it's more important to be eating vegetables and fruits. You know, you're getting plenty of benefits, organic or non-organic. But the dirty 12, or the dirty dozen, um, are the 12 uh, vegetables and fruits that if you get organic, you reduce your pesticide exposure um, by about 90%. So those are the ones that really does make a difference to make sure you know, to spend a little bit of extra money and get those organic. And um, you know, they will cost more, but if you get them in season or at the farmer's market, they're gonna tend to be more affordable. And so I've included that list for you just because this is pretty small. And um, the list comes out from the Environmental Working Group. And they actually have an app for a smartphone. So if you, if you use a smartphone, you can download the app and then have that at the grocery store with you. But it's things like strawberries and spinach and nectarines, apples, so on, um, that are kind of the ones that really make a difference in terms of getting organic. Okay, so I, I don't know if I mentioned that there's gonna be prizes in my, my talk, so this is your first opportunity to win a prize. Uh, I realize it's after lunch, so we need to keep you on your toes here. So if you wanna answer, then I want you to raise your hand so that way I can call somebody out. So adults need 25 to 38 grams of dietary fiber per day. On average, Americans are consuming this much fiber. Is it A30, B10, C, 15 grams, or D, 28 grams? C, 10. 10, good guess. Uh, anybody else? Not, not, not the right 15. answer. <laughs> 15 grams. 15. Yep. What was that? 15. 15, you're right. Okay, so 15 grams. So Naomi, can you give her uh, the Cancer Fighting Kitchen cookbook? Or no, 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 the, yeah, the Cancer Fighting Kitchen cookbook. So I'm passing out some cookbooks from my favorite cookbook author, Rebecca Katz. Um, so yeah, so dietary fiber, um, the typical American is getting about half of the, at least like less than half of the amount of fiber that's recommended. Um, plant foods are naturally gonna be rich in fiber and we've seen fiber being linked with lower cancer risk in many studies, particularly intestinal cancers, breast cancer, some studies with prostate cancer. Um, and it's really important for overall health in terms of weight management, blood sugar management, cholesterol management, um, bowel regularity, and providing something called prebiotics, which I'll talk about in a minute. So just so you can see where we get our fiber from, you don't have to take a fiber supplement. Actually, if you get it from nature, you're getting all those important nutrients and fiber at the same time. So we see you know, basically our beans, our vegetables, our fruits, and our whole grains. And sometimes if you've recently gone through cancer treatment, you may have trouble with fiber. And so that's something where individually kind of looking at how you can gradually incorporate more fiber into your diet or more easily digestible sources of fiber to still get some of those benefits. Okay, so I talked about, um, I've said, mentioned prebiotics a couple times. So 
Prebiotics are fibers that uh, we actually call microbiota accessible carbohydrates. And what that means is that they are food for our microbiome. Our microbiome uh, are hundreds, hundred trillion, we have a hundred trillion microbes that live in and on our bodies. Um, they mostly live in our gut. So we are way more bacterial cells than we are actually human cells. Um, our microbes outnumber our human cells 10 to 1, and our microbiome can weigh up to 5 pounds. So this is, these, these microbes are a pretty important part of, of us, and so we're coexisting with them. They have quite a few important functions. So they regulate our immune system, they help um, protect us from bad bacteria, they can help produce vitamins, things like B vitamins and vitamin K. And so prebiotics are really the very, one of the big, uh, big important components of feeding our microbiome. And so when somebody tells you that you should be eating a Big Mac diet, don't think they mean, you know, hamburger and french fries. They're really talking about you getting more of these um, prebiotic fibers. So this chart up here just has like a quick list of some of the really high, highest prebiotic foods. But pretty much you know, most of your plant-based foods are going to be a source of prebiotics. Um, the ones that really stand out are things like the Jerusalem artichokes, the dandelion greens, the onions, garlic, um, unripened bananas are a great source of prebiotics. And the expert that's studying the microbiome recommends that we try to get at least 30 different plant foods a week to get kind of optimize the health of our microbiome. So think about that when you're filling up your cart at the shopping, at the grocery store, are you getting 30 different plant foods in your cart? So kind of going back to those AICR guidelines, one of the guidelines recommends that we eat more whole grains in place of the processed versions. And so what actually is the difference between a whole grain and a refined grain? It's basically that a whole grain has all three components of that grain. So when we pick it out of the, of the ground, it's gonna have the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. And the bran and the germ are where most of our nutrients are. So we've got the phytochemicals or phytonutrients, those words are synonymous. You've got your fiber, which is your prebiotics, your other vitamins and minerals. Uh, when you refine a grain, really what's left is the starchy part in the middle. We call it an endosperm, and that gives energy to the seed, and it's really what gives us um, energy, calories, basically. So it's the starchy calories in the middle of in the you know middle of the grain. And so when we go from the the whole grain to the refined grain, so we go from that grain to what we call like refined wheat flour. Um, we're losing all of those health benefits, but we're keeping the calories. So most of us don't want the calories without the benefits. And so kind of some of the whole grains, wheat is one of them, whole wheat, but obviously there's tons of whole grains out there. There's things like quinoa, brown rice, wild rice, oats, barley, buckwheat. Um, some of them have gluten, some of them are gluten-free, but there's a wide array of grains that fall into this whole grain category. And you know, if you're actually eating the grain, it's probably pretty easy to know that you're getting a whole grain. So if you go to the bulk section and you get some quinoa and you cook it up, you're, you know you're getting a whole grain, you can feel pretty good about that. But what about if you buy things that have come in packages? That's where it can get a little bit tricky. And so finding whole grains can be very difficult. My first recommendation to you is if, if they're advertising that it's a whole grain, um, be weary. So if you see on the front of the package that it says whole wheat, whole grain, good source of fiber. Um, take a closer look at that ingredient list because they're really trying to sell you something here. There's marketing going on. Um, and what we see in that, in that list is that the first ingredient is enriched flour. Enriched flour basically means white flour that they've added, tried to add the vitamins back into. Um, so if you see enriched flour, wheat flour, those are clues that you have a refined, processed, not whole grain. There is some whole wheat, but it's, it's far down in the ingredient list. Um, so that's not really what we would call a whole grain. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you go to the ingredient list and you see something that says 100% whole grain oats, well, that's, that's a whole grain, no brainer. It's like, you know, you know what you have. Or if you were to go and get a loaf of bread and it said sprouted whole grain, et cetera, as the first ingredient or whole grain this at the first ingredient, then you know you have a whole grain. And so looking at the ingredients is, 
is one way to tell. Um, serving size is really important with grains, so even though we do recommend eating some whole grains, um, serving size does count. So a serving of grains is fairly small. It's about a half a cup of cooked grain. So it could be cooked rice, uh, cooked oatmeal, cooked whole grain pasta, um, a small slice of bread, something like that. That's what we consider a serving of whole grains. So even if you're having a whole grain bagel, just keep in mind you're getting four servings of whole grains right there, typically. Or if you're having a burrito, um, the tortilla alone is kind of a minimum of about four servings of grain right there. So even if you're getting whole wheat, I mean, that's, that's a better choice, but you're getting a lot of grains. The amount of grains that we recommend to consume really varies uh, based on somebody's size and their activity level. But kind of a quick guide is to plan for about three servings of, of grain a day, about three servings of whole grain. Okay, so for guideline number three, we're talking about added sugar. So it recommends avoiding sugary drinks and, um, and minimizing consumption of energy dense foods, for example, things that are high in added sugar. So studies show that Americans are eating way more sugar than what is recommended. Um, it's recommended that females have no more than 100 calories of added sugar a day and men have no more than 150 calories of added sugar. And that translates to about six teaspoons or less for females, nine teaspoons or less for males. So current US daily intake is about four times that much. So we're eating on average about 22 teaspoons or 355 calories of added sugar a day. We're eating a lot of added sugar. So let's have a quiz again. So regularly consuming sugary sweetened beverages um, has been linked with 67% higher risk of cancer recurrence or death in colon cancer survivors. So which of these drinks do you think contains the most added sugar? Is it A, sweetened ice cream tea, B, chai tea latte, C, can of Coke, or D, a vitamin water? Okay, I'm gonna, you, what did you answer? C. Um, good guess, but not, not quite right. Okay, in the very back. Chai tea latte? Chai tea latte, yes, you are right. That has 11 teaspoons of added sugar. And so, you know, she gets a water bottle. <laughs> And so, um, yeah, so all of these did have a lot of added sugar, right? So you, even the uh, ice cream tea had 7.5 7 teaspoons of added sugar. Uh, but the chai tea latte had the most. And um, one of the reasons that the, the recommendation is really looking at sugar-sweetened beverages, even more than other foods with added sugar, is because sugary drinks promote weight gain more so than, than sugary foods do because any kind of liquid sugar is very rapidly digested and absorbed and can promote weight gain very, very easily. Um, and so even drinks that have natural sugar, like fruit juices, have the same action as a sugar-sweetened beverage in your body because you don't have that fiber to slow down the digestion. Um, and if you think about it, to make about eight ounces of apple juice, it takes I think three, three to six apples to make eight ounces of apple juice. So if you think about how quickly you can drink eight ounces of apple juice and how quickly that could raise your blood sugar, and if you're not using that right then and there, it's gonna be stored as fat. Um, you wouldn't probably eat three to six apples at one sitting without feeling really full and getting you know, kind of a little gassy there. So that's part of the issue with sugar-sweetened beverages. So generally, you know, drinking water instead of sugary drinks or teas. And a good rule of thumb is to think about your weight in pounds and drink about half of that in ounces per day. So a 160 pound person would benefit, you know, get need to get about 80 ounces of fluid a day or about 10 eight ounce cups. It's sort of a good rule of thumb for hydration. So, so does it make a difference if you're juicing? It does, no, it doesn't make a difference because when you're juicing, usually you're extracting and the fiber is staying behind in the juicer. The difference is a lot of people juice vegetables and vegetables have a lot less sugar than fruit. So if you're juicing you know, cucumber and celery and kale and lemon, you're getting minimal sugar. That's probably gonna have five grams of sugar for eight ounces. But if it's fruit juice, it's still gonna have you know, all that natural sugar in there. So one of my favorite things is to, to um, add in spa water. I mean, it just sounds nice, right? Spa water. But really, um, 
it's a great way to get some flavor. So if you're one of those people that doesn't really like the taste of water that much, um, spa water is kind of fun. It's infused water. So you take water and you add fruits, you can add vegetables, you can add herbs, and put it in a pitcher and let it sit in your refrigerator overnight and then strain that off. And then you have some really nice flavored water. Um, the water bottle that I gave you actually has a little strainer on the top, a little metal strainer, so you can use that as a fruit infuser. So you can put some fruit in there, and as it sits in there, the flavor, flavor will just start kind of seeping into the water. And um, there's tons of great combinations. You can just try all different, different things, but it really takes water to a whole nother level. So where is the added sugar? A lot of people say, well, I don't, you know, this 22 teaspoons of sugar, that's crazy. I don't even eat dessert, so I, you know, you're preaching to the choir. And I probably am preaching to the choir with a lot of you, but I just wanted to point out where the added sugar could be coming from in a typical diet, even without eating any desserts, uh, from, from getting it from processed foods. So breakfast could be a sweetened yogurt. So blueberry yogurt, we're looking at about 10 grams of added sugar. Not even, I'm not counting the natural sugar that's coming from the milk. I'm just counting the added sugar. Uh, lunch, we're getting a salad. That's healthy, right? But you're using bottled salad dressing, notorious for having a lot of added sugar. So this one would have eight grams per two tablespoons. Um, an energy bar, well, energy bars can be really, really um, significant sources of added sugar. This one has 21 grams of added sugar. And dinner, this would be chicken with a teriyaki sauce, could be a barbecue sauce. A lot of these sauces have a ton of added sugar. This one has 14 grams per serving. And so with this menu, there hasn't really been any added sugar in the day as far as like a sweet or a dessert, but we've got 53 grams of sugar and about 212 calories. And I think that's 13 teaspoons, 13 teaspoons of added sugar there. So how can we make over this day and make it a little healthier, still get a little sweetness in there? So instead of having the sweetened yogurt, doing like a plain yogurt with fruit for sweetness, um, cinnamon is also really sweet. So not only are you getting those phytonutrients, but then you're getting a little bit of sweet sweetener, natural you know, flavor, <laughs> zero grams of added sugar. Um, salad for lunch, but making your own salad dressing, which is one of the easiest things to do. How many of you make your own salad dressing? Great, so basically one part acid, whether it's lemon juice or vinegar, to anywhere from one to three parts oil. So the classic French recipe, typical is three parts oil, but you can use one part oil and you can add water if you're trying to cut back on the calories. And then you just add any kind of spices or herbs that you want and you've got a great salad dressing with zero grams of added sugar. Um, and typically if you make a batch of salad dressing, it'll last in the refrigerator for about a week. So you could make one batch for the whole week. Um, we've switched up the snacks, so there's no more energy bar, but we're still getting a good snack. Some almonds, an apple, and a little bit of dark chocolate for, for fun um, and for afternoon pleasure. So that does have a little sugar, about 10 grams of added sugar. And then dinner, instead of using um, one of those sauces, just kind of using your own marinade with herbs and spices. And really this whole day is down to 10 grams of sugar, for about 40 calories. So the nutrition facts label, I don't know if anybody's looked at a label and been confused and said, well, um, you know, is this natural sugar? Is this added sugar? Has that been something that you've had a hard time figuring out before when you've looked at a label? Anybody wondered that? The reason is because right now the way our labeling laws are, if when sugar is on the label, it doesn't have to differentiate between whether it's added sugar or it's naturally occurring. So you might look at um, an energy bar and you look at the ingredients and you see um, you see cashews and you see date and you see cinnamon and then you look and you see it says oh it has 15 grams of sugar well where is the sugar coming from well that's naturally occurring sugar that's coming from those that fruit that's in the bar um, whereas you might look at that other energy bar that I showed you and you see brown rice syrup as the first ingredient or sugar as the first ingredient and then you're going to kind of figure out, well, that's where the sugar is coming from. But it can be really hard to kind of figure that out. And, and the main thing we want to limit is those added sugars. And so the good news is the label laws are changing. And in 2018, uh, labels will now have to differentiate between natural sugar and added sugar. So you'll be able to look at the label 
and figure out, okay, there says it's 12 grams of sugar, 10 grams are added sugar. So I know right away how much added sugar I'm getting. So the guidelines don't really talk about fat so much. They do, they do recommend um, limiting processed foods high in fat, limiting red meat, and avoiding processed meats. But they don't really give you details regarding what are the healthier fats and um, you know, which, which fats should I consume. And so studies have pretty consistently shown that replacing animal fat and then pre processed fats like hydrogenated oils um, with minimally processed plant-based fats are beneficial for our health. So fats help us absorb a lot of nutrients. So I was talking about the lycopene, talking about um, fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K. We need some fat in our diet to absorb those nutrients. And it also helps us uh, feel satisfied when we eat. And so healthy fats are gonna come from these plant-based foods. So things like avocados and nuts and seeds. So I've got flax seeds up there, walnuts, almond butter, olive oil, um, salmon's in the middle, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But most of these are our plant-based fats. And so not only are they giving us fat, but they also typically have some good nutrients with them too. So for example, if you're eating avocado, you're getting vitamin E, you're getting magnesium, you're getting, um, you're getting fiber. When you're eating flax seeds, you're getting minerals like calcium, you're getting B vitamins, and you're getting um, a really good source of prebiotics. So you're getting those healthy fats, but you're also getting other nutrients. And that's kind of the whole thing is how can we maximize the nutrient density of your diet. So every food is giving you kind of the biggest bang for your buck as far as the nutritional quality. Um, within the fat, uh, kind of looking at fats, one of the things that I think is really key is balancing essential fatty acids. So essential fats are fats that you need to consume regularly to supply your body with adequate amounts. So they have specific functions um, in your body as far as your nerve cells, your cell membrane, um, and they're really important for something called eicosanoid production. And eicosanoids are compounds that regulate our immune system and inflammation in the body. And so what we found is that the standard American diet contains far more omega-6 fats than omega-3 fats. So both of these are essential, but we're way out of balance. And so this imbalance can have negative effects on various aspects of our health. For example, if we're getting too many of the omega-6s, which is, is the common standard American diet, it's really high in omega-6, we're gonna have more inflammation, this chronic inflammation that's been linked with tumor growth, heart, uh, cardiovascular disease, um, tumor progression, um, angiogenesis, which is blood cell for supply going from one cancer cell to another cancer cell, and it, they suppress our immune function. And the reason that we have such an imbalance in the standard American diet is because of eating um, high amounts of meats, especially grain-fed meats, um, dairy fat, egg yolks, um, and certain vegetable oils that are really concentrated in processed foods. So sunflower, safflower, cottonseed oil, corn oil, and then processed foods made with these oils. So we're, we're really heavy on the omega-6s, and then the omega-3s, which the eicosanoids that are produced are more anti-inflammatory. So these inhibit tumor growth and angiogenesis and actually support our immune system and have an anti-inflammatory effect. We don't get enough of them. And it, primarily it's because we don't eat the, enough of the, the good sources. So the cold butter fish, so specifically like wild salmon, trout, sardines, herring, black cod, those are really your highest omega-3 fish. Most people don't eat those fish two or three times a week. Um, and uh, plant sources, most people don't eat a plant source every day, like flax seed, chia seeds, walnut seed, uh, walnuts or pumpkin seeds. So if we can kind of think of it, and purslane is a weed that happens to be really high in omega-3, and sometimes you can find it at the farmer's market, and um, you can use it as like a salad green. And kind of thinking about how can we balance this out, and one way is to think about decreasing the omega-6s, kind of going more plant-based. If you do eat meat, looking at uh, more of a grass-fed, wild game meat, um, omega-3 um, or DHA eggs where they feed the chickens flaxseed, could make it a little healthier. Um, and substituting in olive oil for some of the more processed oils that, that you might use. And then trying to get a plant source of omega-3s every day and then trying to get fish a couple times a week as a way to, to really increase our omega-3s. 
So next I want to talk about the fifth recommendation, is, which is to um, limit red meat. And so for red meat, we're talking about beef, pork, and lamb. So pork is not the other white meat. It's a red meat. <laughs> and the guidelines recommend that we limit it to no more than 18 ounces of red meat per week and that we avoid processed meats altogether. So processed meats, anything that's preserved with smoking, curing, salting, or additives or chemical preservatives. So these are things like your ham, bacon, sausage, hot dogs, deli meats. These are all processed meats. And what we found is that while red meat, high intake of red meat is correlated with, um, say, colorectal cancer and other cardiovascular disease, any regular intake, um, such as a small portion of, of processed meats eaten daily, increases cancer risk. So somebody has a slice of bacon a day, their risk of cancer is, is going to go up, even though it seems like a very small amount. So really kind of thinking about, you know, if you eat meat at all, um, if you eat red meat at all, making it more of a condiment, um, taking it away from that center stage of the plate and just using it a little bit occasionally for flavor, um, for a special treat, and choosing more plant-based proteins instead, so things like beans, lentils, tofu. Um, for animal proteins, choosing more skinless poultry, more fish. Um, I did want to mention with fish, we do need to be a little bit careful with some of the really high mercury fish, so that's going to be things like swordfish, shark, um, king mackerel, uh, ahi tuna, big eye tuna, some of those really large predator fish are going to be high in mercury. So even though I'm recommending, hey, eat, eat two to three servings of fish, you know, deck of card size, um, probably need to limit those high mercury fish if you're, if you're increasing your fish intake. But um, looking at also maybe doing more um, non-dairy sources of calcium. A lot of times people forget that dairy products are animal protein as well. And so how can we get more calcium in the diet without necessarily eating three or four servings of dairy a day? Um, so things like leafy greens and almonds, um, sesame seeds, tofu um, as, as uh, sources of calcium. And they found that people that eat a lot of red meat actually um, eat less plant foods. So again, it's kind of that flip of you're achieving two goals when you're eating more plant-based diet, you're also eating less of the red meat. Okay, so we've got another quiz question. So drinking alcohol, this is, a, this, uh, I think it's the sixth guideline, um, increases the risk for many cancers. So we know that it's linked with head and neck cancer, esophageal cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, stomach cancer. So a lot of cancers um, go up when alcohol intake is, is high. Um, so it's recommended that men have no more than two drinks at uh, the <coughs> night and women have no more than one drink. Um, Per day or per day or night. Um, so what's a standard serving of alcohol? Because that's that's important to know. Is it A, four ounces, B, one cup, C, 240 mLs, or D, five ounces? And you had your gentleman. What it's is, D, five ounces. Very good. So yeah, so D, five ounces. So you get a water bottle. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, so the recommendation is, you know, no more than two drinks for men, uh, no more than one drink for women per day. For breast cancer survivors, there's some research to say, probably a good idea to be a little bit more conservative and ho have no more than two drinks a week. Um, and so just so you can kind of see a visual, so we've got the five ounces of wine, um, one, one and a half ounces for liquor, and then 12 ounces of beer all count as, as one serving. And um, there are definitely some cardiovascular benefits to drinking alcohol, and that's why they, they do, you know, because as far as a camp from a cancer prevention or risk reduction strategy, alcohol increases the risk for cancer. So we don't really get this slight benefit, but we do see some benefits for overall risk of death or all-cause mortality in cancer survivors because a lot of times we're looking at cardiovascular disease and things like that. So there may be some benefits to having a little bit of alcohol in terms of your overall health, um, that being said, if again, if you're not having any alcohol now, the recommendation wouldn't be to start drinking a drink a day to get the cardiovascular benefits. Um, there's a lot of other things that we can do for heart health that don't require alcohol. Um, okay, so one, one more, or a couple, another quiz question. So um, after diagnosis, this is linked with a higher risk of death in women with breast cancer. Is it A, weight gain? B, high intake of soy, C, low intake of calcium, or D, low intake of vitamin A. 
You had a black shirt in the back. A weight gain? Yes, very good. You guys are on top of it. So yeah, greater than, so you get, uh, we'll give you the longevity kitchen. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, greater than 10% weight gain is a link with a higher risk of death in women that have had breast cancer. So I, I do want to take a step back though and, and look at that soy question because a lot of people maybe five years ago or four years ago would have said it's the soy. So a higher intake of soy, that's a breast cancer promoter, right? So this is um, a nice infographic that was put out by American Institute for Cancer Research and it says what, what breast cancer survivors can do. And actually soy is the third recommendation and what they found from the research is that um, diets higher in soy foods after diagnosis have been linked with improved survival for women with breast cancer. So what's this controversy, right? Because there's always controversy. Every, every woman that I talk to that has breast cancer says, what's the deal with soy? Is it, should I eat it? Should I avoid it? I'm not sure if it's okay. Um, and so many of you might have heard that. And really the, compound, the, the controversy stems from the fact that soy has compounds in it called phytoestrogens or isoflavones. And phytoestrogens are chemically similar in structure to um, estrogen but they're actually about a thousand times weaker than estrogen. So what they seem to be able to do is to compete with estrogen and bind to estrogen receptor sites and actually block uh, our more potent estrogen that's a cancer promoter from getting to those cells that may be promoting cancer. So that's where the confusion has really come in is because they're called phytoestrogens and giving, giving mice, which are a lot different than human, really, really concentrated doses of these phytoestrogens when they've been implanted with breast cancer cells actually shows that the breast cancer cells grow. But this is completely a different situation than the studies that have shown that women that eat you know, a couple servings of soy a day have a higher, you know, better overall survival from breast cancer. We're not eating those levels that they would ever get to. That's like eating a truckload of soy every <laughs> and mice actually metabolize soy different than we do, and those isoflavones different than, than we do. So we really can't use those studies for much information in terms of you know, humans and, and soy consumption. And there's been at least five studies now that have shown either a neutral or lower risk of breast cancer recurrence in women that eat soy versus those who don't eat soy. The key is really the benefits from eating soy are going to come from eating whole soy foods versus processed soy foods. Um, and, and not necessarily more is better. So a lot of times in you know, America we think, well, if something's good, I'm gonna do it times 100, right? So we know so far that the average women in these studies are probably eating anywhere from like one to three servings of soy a day. So that's about a half a cup of tofu or an eight ounce glass of soy milk once or twice a day, a half a cup of soybeans or tempeh. They're not eating 10, 10 servings of soy a day. So going for the whole foods, you get smaller amounts of those protective compounds. You also get the other benefits of soy. It's a great source of protein, fiber, it's got calcium. Um, the processed soy is so processed, you don't really get those beneficial compounds. Or if you do get them, they're again in isolation and they're much con more concentrated dose. So I wouldn't use, um, you know, like a soy dog or a soy patty or something like that, or a soy protein bar or the isolated soy supplement on a regular basis, you know, as part of your regular diet. I would go with, recommend going with the whole soy food. So just to talk about obesity, um, going back to that first guideline that recommends that we be at a healthy body weight for risk reduction for cancer and recommending being as lean as possible without being underweight, and that's because obesity has been found to be a risk factor for a variety of cancers. Um, why is that? So how does that happen? So there's basically different mechanisms that have been found where fat cells can increase some different chemicals in our body that are cancer promoters. One would be estrogen. So after menopause, estrogen made by fat cells can make cells multiply faster, um, and that would be breast, breast cells and um, womb cells, so things like endometrial or ovarian cells, and that can increase the risk for cancer. Uh, the, one, the second mechanism is insulin and insulin-like growth factors, and excess fat can cause levels of insulin and other growth factors to rise, which can then alter cells and make them grow more rapidly. 
And then the third uh, link that we think is there is inflammation. So cells in fat called macrophages release chemicals, cytokines, encouraging cells to divide, including cancer cells. So these are kind of the mechanisms by how obesity could be linked with cancer progression um, or risk. And this is really the link between, you know, when you hear people say, I heard sugar feeds cancer. Everybody says to me, I've heard sugar feeds cancer. What does that mean? Basically, I mean, the truth is sugar feeds every cell in our body. So if we have no sugar, if we have no glucose, we can't live without blood glucose. So if we have no sugar, um, our body's going to take proteins we eat or fat and in our liver convert them into glucose because we need blood, blood glucose for our brain to function and for um, our organs to function. The issue with sugar and cancer and how there is that connection is that um, cancer cells are hungrier than healthier cells, so they might use 10 to 100 times more glucose than a healthy cell. And so if there's excess weight and low physical activity or a diet that's got a lot of sugar in it, we're going to tend to see higher blood sugar levels. And what's going to then happen is insulin levels are going to rise. Insulin is that hormone that's like the lock that opens the key to let sugar into our cells. And so when there's a lot of free excess insulin floating around in the blood, um, we can send messages to cancer cells that a lot of them have receptors for insulin that they can proliferate and grow and multiply. And so the idea is that you don't have to think about completely avoiding sugar, or completely trying to have you know, no glucose in your blood because it's not gonna happen. But what we can think about is how can we eat in a way to keep our blood sugar from spiking up and our insulin levels from spiking up, right? So we can keep our blood sugar levels stable. Um, one of the, the biggest things we can do is, is lose a little bit of weight. So five to 10% weight loss we're talking about 200 pound person, losing 10 pounds can actually help um, improve blood sugar and insulin levels. Um, physical activity um, can help improve blood sugar and insulin levels. And so if somebody needs to lose weight, I don't really like to focus on restriction because I don't, I mean, even though I am gonna do a talk on that in August about calorie restriction, but um, I think we want to focus on nutrient-dense foods versus energy-dense foods. So you can see here that these two, um, these two pictures are both about 1,600 calories. And if you think about eating more plant-based foods where there's a lot of fiber and water, you can eat a lot more food, get more nutrients, um, less calories, so you don't have to feel hungry than if you're eating more of a uh, processed food, animal-based type diet. And so nutrient density uh, versus energy density is kind of the way to go if you're trying to cut back on um, calories and lose a little bit of weight. So we want to get, this is another quiz question. So um, let's guess the calorie difference. So the, one of the problems with eating out a lot is that uh, portion sizes have grown a ton over the last 20 or 30 years. And so 20 years ago, if you were to have spaghetti, and spaghetti with sauce and meatballs, if you were to go out to a restaurant, that's the portion you would get. One cup spaghetti, sauce, and three little meatballs. If you were to go out today, you would not be happy if you saw that on your plate, especially <laughs> with the prices you're paying in San Francisco, right? You would want to see a big plate of spaghetti with sauce and three large meatballs. So I want somebody to just take a wild guess with your hand raised about what the calorie difference is. Um, 600. Getting closer. I'll take one more and I'll take the best of three. 500. 500, yes. Yeah. So it's actually 525. So um, can you give this lady the one bite at a time? Yeah. yeah, so we're getting 525 more calories with this meal. So one more question is how long would you have to clean your house to burn those 525 calories? Need more, more guesses here. Okay. You, I'm gonna let you try again in the blue shirt. 90 minutes? A uh, little more, a little longer. Okay. Three hours. A little less. <laughs> <laughs> Take the third, the third guess. Two hours? Uh, two hours and 35 minutes. Wow. Okay. So actually the three hours was closer, so I'm gonna give <laughs> the blue shirt, I'm gonna give you the cookbook and we'll give her the clean soups. So soups, broth-based soups are actually a great way to get low calories. So yeah, you'd have to do two hours and 35 minutes of clean, house cleaning to burn off those calories. Okay, so I'm gonna 
think I'm going to speed up just a little bit, but um, one of the things that I gave you in your handout packages, package was this healthy eating plate. And I like it just because it kind of shows um, how to balance your meals so that you can get um, more vegetables and um, a little bit of balance to keep your blood sugar really stable. So when your blood sugar is stable throughout the day, you're not only going to avoid these blood sugar and insulin spikes, but you're actually going to feel more satisfied with your food, less hungry between meals, have less cravings. And so um, one of the key factors is to include a little bit of healthy protein with each meal. And whether that's a plant-based protein like beans, uh, maybe a little bit of nuts, or whether it's a lean protein like fish or poultry, as opposed to things like the red meat and the cheese and the processed meats, protein is gonna help you feel full longer and it's gonna help keep your blood sugar level stable. As is a little bit of healthy fat. So healthy fat are things like olive oil, um, avocados, again, nuts are gonna give you a little bit of healthy fat. And so what we'll see here is that when you have protein and fat with your vegetables or with your grain or with your fruit, your blood sugar is slow rise and slow fall. So you get the steady rise and fall. And you feel better and you, you can avoid those spikes. Um, and you can stay off of that blood sugar roller coaster that makes us feel so fatigued, actually. And they did a study really small study in women with breast cancer where they put them on a fatigue reduction diet. It's pretty much high in vegetables, some fruit, some high omega-3 foods, um, some whole grains. And the women um, that followed that diet compared to the controls actually reported lower levels of fatigue and better kind of overall quality of life, feeling more energetic. So this is what we call that healthy eating plate is a low glycemic impact. Glycemic impact means how much your blood sugar goes up um, after you eat. We want to keep our diets low glycemic. So again, kind of thinking about filling half of the plate with vegetables, a uh, quarter with protein, quarter a uh, whole grain, or maybe a starchy vegetable like a sweet potato, and a little bit of that healthy fat. So we need to give this meal a makeover. Um, and so just kind of quickly thinking about, this is a sugar-sweetened oatmeal packet. Um, how can we make that a little closer to that healthy eating plate? What could we do to make this meal a little bit more balanced, give it some, some protein, some healthy fat, a little lower glycemic in, impact? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Add some nuts to some real oatmeal. Add some nuts to some real oatmeal. And what do you mean when you say real oatmeal? Um, you know, like steel cut oats. Yeah, so something that doesn't oats. have all this maple and brown sugar sweetener and that's pretty processed. Yeah, so add some nuts to some real oatmeal. That's a great suggestion. And what if you want a little bit of uh, sweetness to it? What could you do to add a little bit of sweetness? Blueberries. Mm -hmm. Add some fruit, yeah, exactly. So now we've got a little bit of fruit, we've got a little bit of protein and healthy fat with the nuts, and we've got a little bit of whole grain. We've got the prebiotics, good, good for our microbiome, we're feeding the gut. Let's give this meal a makeover too. I'm having pasta with some big meatballs with, there is a little bread sauce. I see a little bit of green on there, but not much. <laughs> and some garlic bread in the back. How can we make this meal over? What could we do? Whole grain pasta. Whole grain pasta would be a good start, yep. Mm -hmm. Dump dump the bread. Dump the bread, exactly. Yeah. Let's let's make the carb make the starches a lot slimmer. Yeah. Any anything else? We do one large meatball. One meatball, maybe we could make it half maybe we could make it made of uh, mushrooms and lentils, or we could make it with lean ground turkey. Yeah. Uh, we could add some vegetables in there to cut back on the pasta. We could even use um, some some um, sweet potato noodles. Anybody using a spiralizer these days? It's great. You can put vegetables through a spiralizer and get them to look like noodles, zucchini noodles, um, without even doing the pasta. Okay, so um, the last recommendation is um, about do dietary supplements. And basically, that AICR recommendation is don't rely on supplements to protect against cancer. And the reason for that is basically because studies haven't really shown that any supplement lowers cancer risk. Um, and again, it's probably because of the synergy that we get from those compounds in our foods that we can't really replicate uh, in a supplement at this time. 
And in some cases, we've actually seen that um, supplements where, again, we think something's good. Well, more isn't always better, right? So um, sub some studies where people are given really high doses of beta carotene, we actually see higher risk of lung cancer in people that were former smokers. Um, beta carotene is that orange substance that makes carrots orange. Or um, vitamin E, giving high doses of vitamin E actually has been linked with a higher risk of prostate cancer. Whereas those healthy fats like avocados have actually been linked with lower risk of lethal prostate cancer. So we wanna get these vitamins but at, when we can in the natural form. It doesn't mean that we may not be taking supplements for something else. So a lot of people that have had cancer are going to have issues with bone health. And so they may need a vitamin D supplement, they may need a calcium supplement, but they're not necessarily getting any risk reduction for cancer specifically. Um, just quickly to talk, oh, I have one more quiz. Okay, so both vitamin D and calcium are important nutrients for bone health. Which of these foods is a good source of both calcium and vitamin D? Okay, we've got sardines, egg yolks, turnip greens, or tahini, and you're... Sardines? Yay, yes. So you get the Healthy Mind, our last cookbook. That actually has a great sardine recipe in it. They're called Good Mood Sardines. But yeah, you get a lot of calcium and vitamin D from sardines. So um, eat them up and you get the omega-3s too, right? So you're getting a nutrient-dense food. So I just want to quickly point out that vitamin D is something that our body naturally makes from the sun. Uh, we can get it from food and dietary supplements. And about 42% of uh, US adults are deficient in vitamin D. Probably, and most of you have had your vitamin D level checked and been surprised when your doctor said, you're low in vitamin D, you need to take a supplement. Um, and we see a lot of conditions that have been linked to low blood levels of vitamin D. Um, so what's the, what's the recommended supplementation? Really best to try to um, supplement based on your blood level. We know that 30 to 100 is, is the normal range. A lot of experts feel like we want to be somewhere in the middle, like 40 to 60. Um, so most adults require at least 1,000 IUs of vitamin D3 to stay in that healthy range. Um, the tolerable upper limit is 4,000 IUs, and vitamin D3 is preferred over vitamin D2 in a supplement, um, and to take it with food because it's a fat-soluble vitamin. <laughs> Last, I want to just talk about probiotics. I mentioned prebiotics and how important they are for your microbiome. Probiotics are actually bacteria that when you eat them, they give you benefits. So they are healthy bacteria. And uh, when we eat them in sufficient amounts, we get some health benefits. So they're different than prebiotics, which are food for our bacteria. These are bacteria we're adding in for benefits. And again, just that microbiome has a lot of important functions in terms of our immune system, um, producing nutrients, defending against bacteria, pathogens, and many, many other functions that we're learning so much about right now. Um, there's a lot of fermented foods, and this is where we get our probiotics. And really, ideally, we're eating a probiotic food every day. So we're eating those prebiotics every day, and we're eating a probiotic every day. So probiotic could be from fermented dairy, like kefir or plain yogurt. It has to say live active cultures on it to know that you have a probiotic rich yogurt. There's some probiotic shots or drinks. So this good belly is one example. Um, fermented soy, like miso or natto, which is a fermented soybean. Or tempeh, that's another source. Sauerkraut and kimchi. So these are all the foods that give us these probiotics. Probiotics in supplement form, there's some general uses. So think for various conditions that cause diarrhea, they've been used and, and shown to be effective. Constipation, mostly digestive system issues, but we're looking at more with eczema and different immune conditions and studying probiotics. So if you are taking a probiotic supplement or looking for a probiotic supplement, just a couple things on how to choose. Typically, we want at least 10 billion colony-forming units. So remember, we have 100 trillion bacteria in our, in, our, in our microbiome. So 10 billion is a pretty small dose, so that's a minimum dose. Um, specific strains depending on the use. So if you're trying to use it for constipation, a different strain would be indicated than if you're trying to use it for diarrhea. So doing a little bit of research on what is the effective strain for the condition. And then refrigerated products are preferred. 
Um, if you're taking probiotic supplements, they, they may initially increase gas and bloating, so start with a low dose and increase slowly. Um, we recommend avoiding if you're critically ill or severely immunocompromised. Um, generally, though, they're very safe. Um, if you have had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, it's controversial to use probiotics. And just to give you an idea of some of the reputable brands out there, we have Cultural, VSL3, um, et cetera. So um, just to summarize, this is just a general guideline um, of a nutrition prescription for wellness. And again, you want to start where you're at. So if you're already doing all these things, then you know, pat yourself on the back. But if you, if you need to make some changes, kind of thinking about where you can start. Um, but primarily plant-based diet, bold flavors, intense colors, uh, lean protein, plant protein, and trying to have that at every meal to keep your blood sugar level stable. Getting in those healthy fats. Um, avoiding sugary drinks, limiting added sugars, refined grains, processed foods, fried foods, um, adequate fluids with limited alcohol, being physically physically active, which is going to be the perfect segue for Reagan, who's coming up next, and maintaining a healthy body weight. Um, actually, Jane, who's Reagan's counterpart, always says to me, diet and exercise are Siamese twins. You can't have one without the other, and I love that. <laughs>